talk about the return. We just uh, one of those big events. What else can we do but talk about that? So, uh, what a great day! Praise the Lord. I'm uh, operating entirely in the power of the Spirit, as I said first service. Because I don't know about you, but I started about 4:30 yesterday morning, and it went along and along. In fact, you, you saw the video of the oh, that fast fast paced video at the beginning of the of the, uh, you know the car driving down in the parking lot area. I felt like that was me all day long. Like I've got no time for anything. But praise God, it was a great event. I am so thrilled to have been a part of it, and can't wait to do it again. But uh, so anyway, so I am uh, starting a new series, or the whole pastor team is starting a new series this morning called Finding Jesus in the Feasts of Israel. And so we're going to take a look at that, and this is just an introduction. We're going to have a lesson or a teaching in the coming Sunday mornings on each of the seven feasts. Now, I don't know what your familiarity level is. Maybe this is all new material to you, or maybe you're very aware of the fact that there are these seven feasts that God had given to Moses in Israel. But we're going to talk about it, what they are, but also talk about it in terms of why were they given and is Jesus the actual fulfillment of those feasts? We're going to take a look at that and claim that he is from the scriptures themselves. But they, we have this, we could actually put in that title, finding Jesus and then fill in the blank. Because from cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation, the Bible is about Jesus Christ. He's the topic. He's the subject. Every detail that is in there is there because it's representing who Jesus Christ is. And so God calls us as believers to know his word, to study his word, to find ourselves and show ourselves approved in the understanding of his word. And he's going to tell us that it's all about him. We'll see that in a moment. But not in your notes. I added it last second here and this morning. But Romans 15.4 kind of sets the topic for this, and that is to say that it says in Romans 15, 4, Paul says, for whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. When Paul wrote that, for the most part, the only Scriptures that were available were the books of the Old Testament. We call them the 39 books of the Old Testament. And Paul is saying that whatever was written was written for our learning so that we would understand how to receive from it patience and comfort. And so that gives us the charter to go back and look at things in the Old Testament and understand it as New Testament Christian believers. And as we look at the feast in our studies coming up here in the next eight weeks, There's tension, as I think almost every theological discussion, every topic of Bible has this tension in it of people going to one extreme or the other and not understanding what the Lord actually wants from our study and our understanding of things. In this particular case, you get some tension because some people start reading the Old Testament, the Law of Moses, they see things like the feasts, and they feel like they felt compelled to jump in with both feet and say, well, if God called Israel to do it, I'm going to do it legalistically as well. I'm going to adopt it as a requirement that God has for me in my life. Okay, And then you got on the other side, you got people who go, well, that's all Old Testament stuff. I don't even need the Old Testament. Every, everything I need to know about Jesus Christ is in the New Testament, so why would I even care about feasts of Israel or any of the Old Testament? And so you get this kind of tension, I'm free, I don't need the law. And you got, I'm totally committed, and I, yes, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, but I need to observe and obey all of these 613 commandments in the Old Testament. And we get this tension And I think in most cases, you'll always find that the reality is neither the extreme, but in the proper understanding of God's Word. And so, we are going to look at our Feasts of Israel today. As I said, this is going to be an introduction. So, if, if if, if we go too fast over one particular feast, don't worry, we're coming back to it in the weeks to come. But I wanted wanted to give you kind of a big overview because the, the... Feast of Israel established a calendar for the nation that is really part of their whole existence. They look at the calendar and all the prescribed statutes and ordinances associated with it, and that's how the Old Testament was instructed to live. And so you'll know and understand that when something big comes along like like Passover 
or like the Day of Atonement, which is actually tonight, uh, starts tonight on the Jewish calendar, and tomorrow if it's the actual date. These big events, they kind of pop off even if we're not even paying attention. These big events begin to pop off at us because for thousands of years, the, the nation of Israel has been celebrating these as prescribed in the Old Testament. But we're going to put an overview on that, and just kind of talk about them and just show you that First off, they're clustered in a group of three. So there are seven feasts. They're, we call them the Feast of Israel, Feast of Moses, but there are three what's referred to as holy convocations. Okay? And those, whole, those convocations is a way of saying, the way God calls them to say, I want every person who is able physically to do it to leave their house and come to the place of worship established wherever God it was. Now, and that may sound like a little, what do you mean, wherever God was? Well, if you think about the book of Exodus and the fact that God had instructed them to build a tabernacle, and he said, I will dwell in the midst of that tabernacle. He said, wherever that, and that tabernacle was portable, okay? So if you read the last 15 chapters of the book of Exodus, they had poles and they had priests assigned to carry everything. And so wherever that tabernacle went, they have set it up and established it, and suddenly that's the place where everybody's supposed to celebrate uh, the, these communions or these feasts, okay, or these convocations. Eventually, when Solomon builds the temple, it was pretty well established for, from that point forward that all of that would take place in Jerusalem. But wherever God's presence was were where they needed to go. And it was three times a year, every able-bodied male or person needed to go into that place and then celebrate these. So there's three holy convocations. It always talks about it as being no customary work to be done. It's like an additional Sabbath. And they were to come and completely dedicate their lives to the Lord. So I want you to think about that just in your own reality. If you were called three times a year to travel from your home city and go somewhere and then, and then spend time there, this is what Israel has been doing for thousands of years. And, and so that's what, as it's prescribed in the Lord. But as I said, there's three of these and they're kind of blocked into chunks. You got three and we'll call them spring feasts. You got one that kind of stands alone. It's right at the end of spring. It's kind of a, a middle one. And then you've got three more in the fall. Okay, so seven feasts total grouped into three spring, late, one in late spring and three at the latter part of fall. The springtime observances were an early grain harvest, and so it was important that a follower of Jesus, or sorry, a follower in the Old Testament of God would take, as when, when soon as the crop started to produce, okay, you're coming out of winter, you get into early spring, and suddenly you have some early grains that start to show that life is, is coming back, and you're going to have the ability to survive another season in this uh, culture, in this economy. But God wanted every person to take from the first, very first part of that, and take it, that grain that first came, and make a dedication to the Lord as a way of showing that we trust and believe that God will provide for the rest of the season. God did not say, and the practice was not, well, get through the season, and then save 10% as you go, and then give that as an offering at the end of the season, whatever you have left over. It was always beginning of the season, and then offer that in trust, in confidence that the Lord would continue to provide for you and your families through your uh, agriculture. Okay. And so, they're all, it was always associated with that first part of that, that first grain that was coming, the early spring grain that would come. And then we have these three feasts that are associated with the springtime. So, we have Passover, one we're, the name at least, most of us are fairly familiar with. And then immediately following Passover, so Passover on that month would happen on the 14th, the very next day from the 15th to the 22nd of that month, you would have something called the unleavened bread. And if you read the book of Exodus chapter 12, you'll see that God told him, I want you to celebrate this feast and don't use leaven because you're going to do it in haste. When, that, when this, just this judgment comes on the nation of Egypt that was happening, you're going to have to get up your stuff and go really quickly. So there's no time to let leaven rise, just go. But there's, there's a reason behind that that he didn't want. He didn't say, well, bake a cake a couple of days in advance. He wanted it to be something that was done in haste. We need to make a decision hastily or follow him obediently, but in haste. And then let that leaven not grow. Well, leaven is often or almost always in Scripture referred to as something that corrupts. Now, not doesn't corrupt bread, but it certainly is this concept that a small little piece 
makes big changes in the whole. Okay? So, in the, in, it's also referred to as a, a type of sin or a model of sin. So, one little transgression can corrupt all of us. In fact, it does. When we talk about it theologically, it doesn't take, you know, any more than one sin for us to be condemned forever. And we have no way of paying for that sin. Christ had to do that pain for us. So, that unleavened bread is all, there's a lot of imagery associated with that. We're going to look at that a little bit more. And then finally, there was the Feast of First Fruits. And that one, while most of these feasts fall on a specific calendar day, the Feast of First Fruits always would only fall on a Sunday morning. Because it says that after the Passover, after the Sabbath, the morning following would be the Feast of First Fruits. Um, and so we'll see how, why that's important uh, as we look at the fulfillment of those in a little bit. Then you have in the middle, so those are three springtime feasts. Then in the middle, you have this Feast of Harvest. This is the barley harvest. That's the second harvest that would happen in the, in the season. And it's also referred to as the Feast of Weeks and the Feast of Pentecost in the New Testament. Now, Feast of Weeks may be a little bit foreign to you. Let me explain a couple of things because it all falls into how God views things. And that is God uses things called weeks in a variety of usages more than we would ever use most in our culture today. We say a week, we mean seven days. Well, God did, in fact, mean seven days when he said a week originally, six days of creation, one day of rest equals seven day a week. But then he shows that pattern over and over again in the Jewish calendar and in his law. So what he did was he had, as you know, there's six days of rest, one day of work, but then he put it into a, a collapsed it into a week of weeks, which means seven weeks a period of time. And so that, that period would go from the feast of first fruits, 50 days later, so the next Sunday morning, 50 days later, it would be this feast of Pentecost or feast of harvest. It was tied to the agrarian calendar, meaning he knew exactly how long it would take from the grain offering to get to a barley offering, 50 days. But he called it a feast of weeks, or it's called a feast of weeks because it's a week of weeks, seven, one week of seven week periods. He also uses weeks of years. You look at the Old Testament, you see Six years you shall work the land, one year you shall let it rest. And you, anybody talks to you about that, you'll understand that's actually very, very good and necessary for the land to recover and recoup over that last year. And so there's a week of, and that, and that is this year or this time where God says to Israel, you get an entire year off for vacation, okay? I don't want you to work you don't work one day in seven, don't work one year in seven. You see this pattern start to emerge. And then it even multiplies that one more time, and you get a week of years of week of years, and you get to 50 years. So you go through this whole pattern, six years you, you work the land, one year you rest, and multiply that times seven again, and you get to 50 years. That becomes the year of Jubilee. This year of Jubilee it was the 50th year which according to my calculations means God was asking the nation of Israel to take two straight years off every 50 years, okay? Two years off every 50 years. Well, it's interesting, as we talk about that one just as a sidebar for a moment, there is, to my knowledge, no re recorded historical ac a confirmation that Israel actually ever celebrated a 50th year jubilee. They were instructed to but they can't find any evidence that they actually began to follow this 50th year uh, celebration. So, uh, it, and then when you talk about the seven, one in seven years, um, six years you work the land, seventh year you rest. There's a little side note on this. I don't know exactly when it started. I believe it's still going on today. Uh, so, the, when the observant Jews try to follow the law, and here's what they do because they don't really like that part of it. So they work the land themselves for six years. At the end of the sixth year, they sell it to somebody who's a Gentile, not under the law. And, at, and then that Gentile leases the land use back to them, and they work the land under the Gentile ownership for a year. And at the end of the year, the Gentile sells them back their own land, and then they pay the, that Gentile owner a little something for helping them in this transaction to get through and around a loophole in God's law. So, seems acceptable to them, doesn't seem quite uh, right to me. All right, and then we have, so you have three feasts in the spring, one spring in the middle, and then three springs in the, or three feasts in the fall. So, you have the Feast of Trumpets, 
And this is also interesting on the calendar. If you look at the book of Exodus, God tells Moses, make this month the beginning of your year. But that was the seventh month on the civil calendar. And so they, what he does is he makes it the first month on the, what we'll call the religious calendar, and those are the, now the springtime feasts. Like God restructured and reordered everything to make it work. And, you, and sometimes you scratch your head and go, well, why would God care? What, what's, what's the difference? It part of all of this feast process, because he, wa- he wanted us to know, I'm gonna, as your year progresses from a religious perspective, it's going to start with Passover. Okay? But then you get to these fall feasts, and if you don't know, the Jewish calendar actually celebrates the new year in the fall. That's their civil calendar. And they keep both calendars in operation at the whole time, and so both of them are kind of the beginning of the year. One begins the religious year, and one begins the civil year. And this Feast of Trumpets is like an announcement. We would call it New Year's Day. It's like this blowing of the trumpet saying, the new year is here. Something is changing. Something is different. It's that new year. And so it's the, it's the new year, but it's the seventh month on the other calendar. And so you also have a week of months in that whole process. So you seven, one month is the feast, the spring feast, get to seven months, and then you get the last month of that seven year or that week of months, and you get to what this, these fall feasts that are happening here, in the, like beginning with the Feast of Trumpets. So we call that Rosh Hashanah. It simply means the head of the year, Rosh Hashanah. And then you get to the next day, 10 days later, you get the Day of Atonement, uh, which is the most holy day on the, on the Jewish calendar. It's the one day when, regardless of everything else, and you're following the law, there's, you know there's transgressions in your life. You know there's sin against God in your life. And so he asks you to come and, on this Day of Atonement, make, it, make, a, make a confession of your sins before the priest, bring your offerings, and then the high priest, on this one single day, would lay his hands on actually two sacrificial lambs, and one would be slaughtered, and and the blood would be taken into the Holy of Holies only once a year in order to make all that work. And the other one, they would lay the hands on it, confess all the sins, and would go cast it out into the wilderness. Other side note on that is that uh, in order, so the, the scapegoat was supposed to take the sins of the nation and carry it away and out of the camp and be gone forever. Israel got really concerned that the, they might wander back into camp. So my understanding is that they would push it off the cliff, make sure that it didn't come back. But again, just practices. And then finally, you have the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booze or, or a week where they were called to l- move out of their permanent residences and live in tents for one week. Most of us have probably heard of that. So these are the seven feasts. Does any of that sound like Christ to you? Like something in there is going on? Well, maybe a little bit, but we're going to look at it and kind of do a much more deep exploration of these seven feasts and look at it because there's some number of things we need to know, and that is that number one or number two on your list is that Jesus Christ is the primary and fundamental purpose of all Scripture. He's the purpose. He is the fundamental of all Scripture. Okay. And so, I say that, how do, you, how do you challenge that? You look at that and say, there is a understanding in Scripture, proven by what it says, by Scripture itself, that Jesus Christ is the cent- central, primary, fundamental character or s- a reason why Scripture exists. So, in Hebrews 10.7, it says, in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will. Some, some will say in the volume of the scroll and some of the volume of the book, but the, that term there in Greek actually means the, the scroll or the knob of the, of the scroll. So if you look at a picture of what that actually is, so here's a picture of some ancient scrolls, and you see the kind of the wooden caps on the end of it, okay? So everything's scrolling out. He's, what Jesus Christ is saying there in Hebrews 10 is that I, in the volume of the book, or between the the points of the scroll, everything in there is written about me. You you get the picture? He's not saying, you'll find some evidence of me in the Old Testament. He's saying, in the volume of the book, it is written of me. In between those wheels, everything in there is written about me. He's the purpose of all Scripture. Well, there's more. So, he also says, 
in John 5, 39, he tells the, the, I believe the scribes, he says, you know, you search the scriptures and yet you're not finding me, but it's those that are testifying of me. So the scriptures are testifying of Christ. And again, specifically when Christ was on the earth, there was no New Testament. He's talking about the Old Testament. Between the scrolls, all the scrolls, every word is there in, intentionally to tell us about Jesus Christ. We, our role is to find out why. How do the things that we don't necessarily immediately think of Jesus Christ in, how do we understand them as Christ-centered? And then also Jesus uh, in Luke 24 says, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded, Jesus expounded to them in all the scriptures, all the scriptures concerning himself. You can say all. In the beginning, Moses, in, 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 the beginning of Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. That was a very intense Bible study for about seven miles or whatever it may have been. All right, and then every D, every ceremonial practice given to Israel was intentionally established to reveal truths about the coming Messiah. I don't know if you'll accept that initially, but let's work through that in the study. They are intentionally given to reveal truths about Jesus Christ. So, Here's, here's a challenge. Anytime you're reading Scripture and you see something, you go, I'm not sure what's going on there. Or, I don't understand these, these seven feasts. Or, I don't know why they would apply to me today. Put Christ in there and say, how does this relate? And in fact, in most of these cases, we will find direct New Testament references that Christ was the fulfillment of the very thing that was established. Okay. So, like in the Feast of Passover... If you turn to 1 Corinthians 5, you will see that Christ is referred to by Paul as our Passover. Okay. So in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, it says, Therefore purge out the old leaven. Well, that's a reference right there to the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Purge out the old leaven. So he's putting Christ in the middle of that. And therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you are truly unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Now, I want you to get the language here for a moment. He didn't say Christ is like our Passover. Christ is familiar with the Passover or if Christ used the opportunity of the Passover to do something you should also remember. He's saying specifically that Christ is the Passover. Meaning, by extension, the Passover that was given to Moses and celebrated for 1,500 years until Christ got here was incomplete. It did not have its full meaning yet fulfilled. They were, they were following it, they were obeying it, they were going through the rituals and the motions of it, but it couldn't be complete because Christ is the Passover. The Passover they were celebrating as described, and if you need reference verses, uh, Exodus 23 and Leviticus 23 both talk about these seven feasts. Okay. I think it's kind of easy to remember because it's Exodus 23 and Leviticus 23, but they talk about these seven feasts, and they were, they were incomplete because Christ is our Passover. He's the one who fulfilled all that. And so, we, we should be looking at that. If, if Paul says that Christ is the Passover, that ought to be a trigger to us to say, let's go look at the Passover. If Christ is our Passover, surely God was telling us what to know about Christ in his description and requirements of the Passover. He's also the feast of unleavened bread. We just saw that here in 1 Corinthians 5, that Christ is the one whom the leaven, there was no leaven, all leaven was purged out. He's that unleavened lump, meaning there's no sin in Christ. He's the sinless Savior, and there's multiple places in John and many other places in Scripture that talk about Christ being without sin, meaning he is the, he is the embodiment of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then the Feast of first fruits is the demonstration, and I'm not making this up myself, this, Christ is the demonstration, or the, or the fe first Feast of first fruits is the demonstration that Christ is our guarantor of a resurrection for our lives. Take a look, if you're in 1 Corinthians now, take a look at chapter 15, the resurrection chapter. So chapter 15, all of it's about the resurrection, but let's look in verse 20. It says this, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the firstfruits, not a firstfruit, 
It has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Since by man came death, by man also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Do you see what he's trying to communicate to us there? Is that Christ going to the cross, but on the, on the day, on the Feast of First Fruits, Sunday morning, Christ is raised from the dead. And that is the guarantee that we also, if we put our faith in Jesus Christ, will also be raised from the dead. We will be raised in eternity with him. He's the guarantee. The whole Feast of First Fruits is to say that Christ is the first one ever to be raised from the dead, to ascend into heaven, but that is the promise, that is the guarantee that we also, like him, will be. Remember I said at the beginning, they were supposed to take of that harvest the very beginning of it, the very first of it, and say, that's God's. That very first grain offering comes, it's God's. Everything else is for the blessing of man, but the first part is God's. Well, that exactly fulfills what's happening here in the Feast of first fruits. Christ was God's offering and Christ was God's guarantee that all who follow will be resurrected. That's exactly what Paul has just said here in 1 Corinthians 15. He is the guarantee that we will be resurrected also. So Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of First Fruits, they're all made references to in the New Testament and not just, again, not just, well, similar to, like as, but Christ is the fulfillment of them, and they were always incomplete until Christ came and demonstrated they were written about him so that he would fulfill them. They were only models or types or examples until he came. Hope you can get that. If you're not, you're going to see more of that as we go, because we're going to look at Passover, and then we're going to look at each one of these in the coming weeks that are on our schedule here, so... Then look at the Feast of Harvest, okay? So the Feast of Harvest, that barley offering that happened the second harvest here, the harvest season called the Feast of Weeks and in Pentecost, okay? And so he also is the fulfillment of that. He is that harvest. Now, this feast, this middle feast is called Pentecost for most of us, and we recognize that it's the day that the church was born, So it's really symbolically very significant that we have these first three feasts. Jesus Christ fulfilled each one of them. He actually fulfilled them each on their day that they were observed and on the Jewish calendar. And then we have the church being born on Pentecost in the middle of that. Wonder what that represents. Well, let's let's talk about that in just a second because when we get to the next set of feasts, like the Feast of Trumpets, there's this Starting, remember, we had this new calendar, and these, these, these feasts and celebrations over here were at the beginning of the new year, the beginning of that, that's, that's a ceremonial year, and then you get to the next one, and this is the beginning of something brand new again. That seventh month was the beginning of something new, and they would blow a trumpet, and it would start something new. So trumpet being blown, well, that's fairly significant. You take a look at 2 Corinthians Move over one book or however you do it digitally. Second Corinthians five, sixteen. Okay. Therefore we we regard no one or therefore from now on we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet we are now known in him that thus wow, I'm you can tell I'm tired. Okay, sorry. You, yet uh, now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And then it's later tied to the blowing of a trumpet. It's like the the blowing of that first trumpet. So there's this beginning of the year, the head of the year, head of something new. And there's this tie to Jesus Christ being creating in us a new creation as part of that trumpet blowing. But not just a new creation on this planet. It's really talking about a resurrection life moving towards a resurrection life. And so we see that in 2 Corinthians. We also see it in 1 Corinthians again, Thessalonians. Christ is the day of trumpets, meaning when he comes, that's an announcement that he's coming and he's going to return. He's going to grab all believers and bring them into relationship with God in eternity. Um, Some people refer to this or, or think about the Feast of Trumpets as part of the rapture of the church. 
But notice in none of this, it doesn't say pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. It just means that when that final trumpet blows and we all get raptured out of here, that that is start of a brand new life in, the, in a glorious body that he will give all of us in the new creation. Okay. So, that's the promise, not only that we will be raised with him, but also that we will be glorified because of him. Okay? And then we, the next one is the Day of Atonement. Okay? And so this is a feast for Israel. If you want to call it a feast, it's really a day of affliction where they afflict their souls and confess their sins and do all that stuff that we talked about. But in Hebrews 9, it, it refers to, let's jump there real quick so you're not out of context. Hebrews 9 verse 24, says, for Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself. So Christ's sacrifice was not about the earthly stuff, it's about the heavenly stuff. Okay, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year on the day of atonement with the blood of another. He would then have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So he is that, he is that, he's moving forward the day of atonement. He's accomplished that. He's gone into heaven and when we stand before the throne of God, there is this incredible exchange that happens. Christ's righteousness becomes my righteousness. My sinfulness was borne by Christ on the cross and paid for by him. This incredible exchange that takes place. Okay. And then, finally, a Feast of Tabernacles. Well, it may sound familiar to you to recognize and understand that multiple, both Paul and Peter in the New Testament, refer to what we're living in here today, what we walked in the door in today, as being a tent, a temporary residence for us to dwell in. He wants us to take a time of, of remembering that this is but a blip in our eternal existence. If we focus too much on this tent living, we will ignore the permanent residence that he is establishing for us in heaven. And so the Feast of Tabernacles is, is there at least as an annual reminder to remember that we are not citizens of this planet. We are citizens of heaven. Our temporary residence is on this planet. Our permanent residence is in heaven. And so that feast is there to remind us of that. Now, I said we would talk about the Feast of Harvest because I left that off uh, for a moment. What's in between? Well, if Christ came on the cross and fulfilled Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits, and then 50 days later came the birth of the church, and then these last ones are about all of our resurrection life in Christ going up into heaven, well, in between is the harvest. In between is the church. We are called, and yesterday was a great example of that, we are called to humbly serve our God, and we are called to increase the Lord's harvest. So the Lord is waiting to blow that last trumpet. He is waiting to change our residency from tents into a permanent residence because he is waiting and desiring for his harvest to grow. And the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are too often too few in that. But that's our calling. That's why we live in this specific moment in time, is to bring unbelievers into relationship with Christ and increase the harvest. Okay, so yesterday, repenting of our own sins and seeking revival. The last part of yesterday at the return was seeking revival, meaning we need to get people on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ. Believers and unbelievers need to be harvested in this time away from their sins and away from their rejection and rebellion against God. One last kind of image here, and that is this seven-lamped stand or lamp stand in the, also in the book of Exodus. It's, it's construction. It's called out. I've seen other, other uses of this as a model, like six, six branches in one center, talking about man versus Christ. But this is actually, I think, what the purpose, why this candle burned in the holy place that God established under Moses, and then later on, this was to tell us about the feasts of Israel. See, there's three on the left, let's call those springtime feasts, and you got three on the right, let's call them fall time feasts, and you got one in the center, 
and that is that Feast of Harvest in the middle that we just talked about, okay? Now, interestingly, that whole thing, God very specifically told them, make, told Moses, make sure you make that of one single piece of gold. Not just bring a whole bunch of other dis, you know, disparate pieces of gold. One piece of gold. Gold represents the deity of Christ. One single piece means Christ is in every one of those feasts. If that is a model of Christ, Christ is. We're, he's been telling us for thousands of years now, Christ is in these feasts. One piece of gold, seven feasts, three have been fulfilled directly at, at the cross, one is being fulfilled as we speak, three will be fulfilled in Christ in the future when he wraps up all things. So there's a great model there. All right. So as we look at a conclusion here at the top of the hour, a couple of things. I want you to see some promises that are given to us and the fulfillment. So one is that Christ is our Passover lamb. And it's, it's interestingly, as I mentioned earlier, Christ fulfilled each of these first four feasts on the day that they were being observed in Israel. And there is no accident. There is no happenstance. It was all intended by God, but not because God could do it, but because when God established the feasts, he knew the day that Christ would suffer and die. It's different than Jesus or anybody else saying, well, it's the feast of Passover. It'd be a good day to go to the cross. In fact, none of the Jewish leadership wanted it to happen on the Passover. They were doing everything they could to prevent it from happening on the Passover. But that was the day in all of human history that God said, my son will suffer and die in order to pay for the sins of the world. That's the day established in eternity. Not let's, observe, let's wait 1,500 years and find out the right year to do it in. It was established from eternity. In fact, there's a prophecy in Daniel that gives a specific day 500 years before Christ was born, the specific day on which that would be fulfilled, and it was fulfilled on that day. Passover, of course, so fulfilled. Feast of Unleavened Bread picks up, as we see in Paul's writings in the New Testament, Christ fulfilled that also in the cross on Christ, uh, the cross of Christ 2,000 years ago. And then as we saw 50 days later, the Feast of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, we see it literally fulfilled. The church is literally born to engage in the harvest of souls on the day it was prophesied and commanded for Moses 1,500 years before Christ. Okay? All fulfilled, which of course leads many to believe that any time we're talking about the return of Christ, that there's probably going to be a literal calendar fulfillment on the specific day of the Feast of Trumpets and the Feast, uh, or the Feast, if you want to call it that, the Day of Atonement, and then Feast of the Booze or Tabernacles. All of that will be fulfilled on their literal day. Of course, we don't know if we're on the right calendar or not. How many times have we changed our calendar in the last 500 years or, or 2,000 years or whatever it may be? But Literal fulfillment on those days is a very strong possibility based on the fact that the first four were literally fulfilled on their observance days as well. Okay. So those are coming. How do we finish this? How do we look at this? Okay, I, I, I don't want anything to be just an academic exercise or just, a, okay, well, that is still I'm wrapped up in, this is all Old Testament, what, do I, what am I supposed to do with it? Let's talk about how we can honor God today. And then you'll hopefully see that again each week as we study each of the seven feasts. Understand, remember, and honor and celebrate all that God has done through these feasts. I'm not asking you to celebrate the feasts the way they were prescribed to Moses. I'm saying we should be very aware of the, what Passover means, what it means for Christ to be our perfect sinless Savior, and what it means for Him to be the guarantee of our resurrection as well as his call, his charge for us to be the Feast of Harvest. He is fulfilling it through us, through the power of the Holy Spirit. He's calling all of us to bring souls to him in the harvest. Okay? Treasure is the fill in the blank there. Treasure the whole counsel of Scripture, for it is they that testify of Christ. He's asking us don't set certain passages, don't set certain books, don't set the whole Old Testament on the shelf and don't pay any attention to it. He's saying to us through Scripture, treasure the whole counsel of God. 
And that means looking at these things in specificity to find out what, is, what do we have, what does God have for me in looking at these Old Testament passages, references. Of all of the Old Testament, I, I find it hard to put anything above the feasts of Israel in terms of how significant and important they are to the person of Christ and our understanding of who He is. Really, really significant. And finally, be thankful for God's use of models and types in the Scripture. If Scripture was just written with a whole bunch of facts, details, stuff that's just like dunk, 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 bullet points and all that kind of stuff, it would be so much different than the actual Scriptures we have. Because look at the multifaceted character of God. He wants to communicate to us, yes, directly through narrative, but he also wants to communicate it to us through models, through celebrations, through remembrances. He, he knows how forgetful we are. He knows how easy it is to take facts and just compartmentalize them out of our mind. But feasts and observances, something that shows up on our calendar every year, you'll notice all throughout Scripture, God tells everyone, make a memorial. Something significant happens. He says, put up stones, make a memorial. Something that significant happens, here, we're going to celebrate this for the rest of your days forever. Passover, Feast of First Fruits, whatever it may be, we're going to celebrate this because you'll forget it if I don't remind you of it every year. That's why God has created a scripture that is so multi-layered and so multifaceted because he wants us to know him as a creator God, as a, as a creative God, a God who does not lock himself into one method or model of communication. He's got many ways of doing it so that scripture is ultimately inexhaustible. We keep reading it over and we keep reading it over and studying it and studying it and studying it and we come back and something is fresh, anew, again for the very first time. Every single time. I can't tell you how well I know certain books of the Bible and have read them thousands and thousands of times and I read it again and I get something new each and every time because it's that dense with the truth of God and so dripping with the Holy Spirit teaching us about God. So, with that exhortation, let's pray. Father God, we are indeed deeply in love with you I pray, Lord, that each of us would have a passion to know the truths that you communi communicate to us through your word, Old Testament, New Testament, narrative, typologies, whatever it may be, Lord, I pray that we would be receptive vessels for all that your spirit wants to do to guide us and lead us in your perfect truth through the power of your word. And Lord, I pray that we would have a mind like Christ to understand and to know the significance of so many details like these seven feasts in Israel. Lord, they're not ancient and they are not something to be discarded, but they are something to be accepted and understood and celebrated because they talk specifically about Jesus Christ, our one true Savior sent into this world to suffer and die so that we might live. And all of that has been foretold thousands of years before he got here through your word, through your prophecy, and through these models that we've seen this morning. So Lord, I pray that we would receive that and that we would go forth celebrating the greatness and the goodness that you have for us in Jesus' name. Amen. And by the way, as I mentioned, so tonight really is the celebration on the Jewish calendar of the Day of Atonement. So that's why that return, that 10 days of prayer and return, it started on the Feast of Trumpets, the 18th, and it ends tomorrow night, or tonight starts, but ends tomorrow night, Feast of the, uh, the Day of Atonement. So go out and celebrate, but also, just as we did yesterday, let's repent and let's look for revival in God's church because we are so humbly submitted to His authority that nothing else will get in the way. Amen. Have a great day.